The next several weeks, we are going to be paying attention during worship to uh, chapters 17, 18, and 19 in the Gospel of Luke, listening in particular to Jesus talk to us about the way in which the life we live in this world, in the kingdom of God, is upside down from the way that it's lived in our culture. It was upside down in his day. Uh, the way things were done in Jesus' world were turned topsy-turvy by the things he taught about the kingdom of God. And as it turns out, in every culture, in every age, the kingdom of God turns the human culture on its head and says there's another way that we are called to live, another direction we are called to take. And we're going to listen to Jesus talk about that in some important ways. Sometimes in this world, we tend to see life as sort of like a pair of balance scales. We spend time putting things on one side and piling them up and piling them up. Good things we put on that one side of that. We put on there our service to the church and our volunteering and various organizations. We put our charitable contributions and our financial gifts to the church. We pile up on there our attempts to be a good husband or wife, a good father or mother, a good child, a good employee, a good student, a good boss, a good professional in our field. We just keep pouring all our good efforts up on one side. And then, consciously or not, we sometimes think it's God's turn. It's God's turn to put something on the other side and balance the scales out, as if God sort of owes us something. Now, I know you and I, we would we'd deny that right and left. I, I don't I don't believe that. I know. But I think the belief is there because when things become difficult in our life, sometimes even unbearable, without effort, without intent, that thought flashes across the screen that says, what did I do to deserve this? Haven't I been good? Still, after all this time, we human beings, and because it's, it's the culture, we human beings still have a, a stake in the old God blesses those who are good and he sends bad things to those who aren't good. Good things happen to good people. Bad things happen to bad people. And when we've tried to be good and tried to do good, and yet we struggle because of the circumstances in our life in one way or another, and it hurts, there's that brief moment where we say, what's wrong? It's not fair. The scales are somehow supposed to balance. Here in this life, not just someday, but here in this life. We learn the phrase at about age four or five. It's not fair. And we never really get it out of our vocabulary. It's still there. No, no matter how much we know better, it's wired into us to think that somehow the scales are supposed to balance. And part of the reason that we cling to this notion is because that's the way the world works, at least when it's working right. The everyday world tries to work on the principle of justice. It doesn't always get it right, but it tries to. We expect to be paid fairly for our work. We work and we receive a paycheck. We expect to be treated fairly at home and at work and at school. We expect that if we work harder, we're going to make more. If we practice harder, we're going to win more. If we think harder, we'll understand better. If we give ourselves more and more to developing our skills, we're going to come up with some kind of a bonus or some kind of a tip or some kind of a raise, something that demonstrates a reward for our loyalty and our dependability and our hard work and our competence. We, we believe that's the way the world's supposed to work. And though it doesn't always work that way, it's the direction our world po points. We work hard, and we receive something for what we do. Now, when we bring that kind of expectations, consciously or unconsciously, into our relationship with God, we do a world of damage to our understanding of our relationship with God. We get that good things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people kind of theology working for us. And then in our thinking, God's blessings become something that we earn, something that we deserve, something that God needs to put on his side of the scale to balance things. The blessings of God are the perks the raises, the tips, the bonuses that are supposed to accrue to us because, well, we've, we've been good. Now, that belief can be subtle on our part, but to the degree that it's there, it can be devastating to our relationship with God. 
Because the kingdom of God is founded on grace, God's grace, not on works of any sort. It's this upside-down world where we do not get what we deserve and where we cannot earn or work our way through it. It's the only place in life that's that way. It is the kingdom of God. It is upside down from everything we've known and know in all of our life. Now, I want to be clear, though, that this kingdom of God is not a world where we just sit back and draw spiritual unemployment because we don't have to work for anything. Not at all. The kingdom of God is filled with duty and obligation and responsibility. Uh, German theologians used to talk about the kingdom and God's grace as being, on the one hand, gift, and the other hand, responsibility. It is gift and responsibility. The words in German sound similar. I won't try to pronounce them for you. But this life in the kingdom is full of things to do. Dallas Willard said, grace is not opposed to effort. Grace is opposed to earning We have something we're called to do, but we cannot, by doing it, earn anything from God. That's the upside-down nature of this kingdom. Jesus teaches us that this is where our obligations are serious, but grace nevertheless prevails. We have work to do, hard work, but it earns us nothing. And that's a hard thing to get into our heads. So, Luke 17, he takes up this lesson with us. And I invite you to turn there if you'd like, or the words will be on the screen. Jesus said to his disciples, things that cause people to stumble are bound to come, but woe to anyone through whom they come. It would be better for them to be thrown into the sea with a millstone tied around their neck than to cause one of these little ones to stumble. So watch yourselves. If your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them. And if they repent, forgive them. Even if they sin against you seven times a day and seven times come back to you saying, I repent, you must forgive them. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. He replied, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it will obey you. Suppose one of you has a servant plowing or looking after the sheep. Will he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, come along now and sit down to eat? Won't he rather say, prepare my supper, get yourself ready, and wait on me while I eat and drink. After that, you may eat and drink. Will he thank the servant because he did what he was told to do? So you also, when you have done everything, everything you were told to do, should say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. Jesus begins with this obligation that is ours to live the life of the kingdom faithfully with each other. We are called to live in line with the Christ we have said yes to follow. We are called to live out the gospel and its implications. Our lives are more and more to take on the values and expressions of the kingdom of God as Jesus taught them to us. Jesus said, you can't eliminate all the stumbling blocks out there. What he literally says in Luke's original language is, it's impossible for causes of stumbling not to occur. It's impossible. It's the nature of the world we live in. We are going to mess up sometimes, but sometimes our messing up throws a stumbling block in the path of someone who is weak or vulnerable, and it can turn their faith aside. And Jesus says, there are causes of stumbling that will be everywhere in this world. Just don't be one of them. To the degree it's possible, do not be one who causes these little ones to stumble. These are people who are weak or vulnerable or struggling with their faith in Christ, people who are easily discouraged, maybe people that are considering faith in Christ. And our lives lived in the kingdom, lived unfaithfully, can throw a scandalon was the word, a scandal, a cause of stumbling into their path. And Jesus said, don't let that be you. For your part, don't be one of those who contribute to the downfall of a brother or sister by the way you live or act or talk or relate to them. Don't be the reason that one of them says, if that's what Christianity is about, if that's what following Jesus is about, I don't want any more to do with that. Don't be a cause of stumbling. They can look at us, these little ones, and see our joylessness and say, if that's Christianity, 
I'm not sure I want it. They can see our judgmentalism and stumble. They can look at our list of religious rules and regulations and stumble. They can hear our self-righteousness and stumble. They can look at our passionless religion and stumble. They can see our consumptive lifestyles and our lack of generosity and stumble. They can see us cozy up to Caesar for power or security rather than trusting in King Jesus and stumble. They can read our hurtful, hateful comments on social media and stumble. Jesus said, don't be one who puts stumbling blocks into the paths of these little ones. Your life is to be lived faithfully as part of the gospel. He says that to be the source of stumbling for others by our unfaithful living has got profound consequences. He doesn't say what they are, but he says it'd be better to have a millstone tied around your neck and thrown into the Mediterranean than to be one of those who causes people to stumble by living unfaithfully. That's pretty heavy. We're obliged to live faithfully in the kingdom of God. And if that weren't enough, Jesus proceeds to say that we have this obligation to be unbelievably reconciling and forgiving toward others. I mean, unbelievably. He says, if your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them. And if they repent, forgive them. Even if they come to you seven times in a day and say, I repent, you must forgive them. That's so upside down. I mean, in this case, we are the ones who have experienced the offense. And yet Jesus says we are the ones who have the obligation to seek out the offender, to seek reconciliation, to rebuke. That sounds harsh, but it means talk it out, confront it, deal with it, talk about what it means, take initiative, restore the relationship, even though we are not at fault. Now, parenthetically, I think it'd be a good idea to review our part in the issue thoroughly, whatever it is, because my experience is that I've got a part to play on almost everything that's gone wrong in a relationship with anybody. I've got a part to play. But the point is, it's our responsibility, however deeply offended we are, however deeply, really, truly hurt we are, to seek reconciliation with the offender. And then, that's one thing, but... Should the offender repent and say, I'm sorry, please forgive me? It's our obligation to forgive them. And not only that, if it were to happen seven times a day, every single day, from the same person, Jesus said, you must forgive them. Now, that's upside down mathematics, if you ask me. You don't do that kind of math in your head. You do it in your heart. Jesus chooses a number just high enough. If he said twice, eh, I could forgive somebody twice. But he chooses a number just high enough to make it clear that this is something extraordinary that we've been asked to do. It is about the readiness of the disciple's heart to be a forgiving and reconciling person. That's what he's addressing. And he calls us to put a strain on our own capacity to forgive. Now, that subject, forgiveness, is a pretty big one for Jesus, actually. It's, uh, it's in the top five or six things in the New Testament that he talks the most about. One of the reasons is that the kingdom of God that he has come to initiate, this upside-down kingdom, he sees as um, kind of a perpetual year of jubilee from the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, every 50 years, Israel was supposed to proclaim the year of jubilee. And during the year of jubilee, all the debts in the whole culture were forgiven. Everybody became debt-free, just like that. Wouldn't Dave Ramsey have loved that place? All debts are forgiven. All the land that you've had to sell in order to support yourself that once belonged to your family reverts back to the original family that it belonged to. Slaves are set free every 50 years. Now, there's some questions whether Israel ever really practiced the year of Jubilee. It's because it's so radical, so upside down. But when Jesus came preaching, he said it back in Luke 4, he proclaimed the favorable year of the Lord. I've come to set the captives free. And when Jesus talks about forgiving, he's doing Jubilee language. He is saying this is the time when all stuff is forgiven. Reconciliation is everything. Debts are wiped out. The form of the Lord's Prayer that we pray the least, forgive us our debts as he for we forgive our debtors, is language that goes right back to the year of Jubilee. And when Jesus talked about 
relationships. He talked about forgiveness, not just forgiveness from God to us, but the forgiveness that we're supposed to offer to one another. He says in the Sermon on the Mount that if we're at the altar worshiping, we're in a worship service, and we're right in the middle of doing something really important, and we remember we have a brother or sister who has something against us. We're supposed to leave the place of worship and go reconcile to our brother or sister and then come back and worship God. It's that important. When he tells us how to pray. He gives us the Lord's prayer and includes that phrase, forgive us our debts or forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And the only phrase from the Lord's prayer that Jesus gives additional comment to is that phrase. When Peter asked him, Lord, how often should my brother, if my brother sins against me, how often should I forgive him? Seven times? Matthew 18 and Jesus says, no, more like 70 times seven, Peter. You don't ever stop forgiving. You don't even keep records. Forgiveness is a part of this kingdom of God. It's upside down. And Paul picked that up in his instructions to the churches repeatedly. So here's the deal. The kingdom of God, living with one another, sinners that we are, means that there are going to be offenses that come along. I'm going to offend you, and you're going to offend me. If we live life close enough together, if we live together in families, there will be offenses that come. If we work together, there will be offenses that occur. The question is, in the kingdom, how do we deal with those? And Jesus said when we're on, the res- on one end, we try our best not to cause them, throwing stumbling blocks in one another's path. But when we're on the receiving end of them, we have to have an endless supply of forgiveness. It's our obligation to seek out the offender, talk and pray it through, forgive when necessary, as often as necessary. Those are kingdom duties, kingdom obligations. No wonder the disciples responded to that bit of teaching by saying, Lord, increase our faith. I'm not sure we can live that way. Jesus' response to that says, your faith doesn't need to be increased. It needs to be placed in the right object of faith. Seed-sized faith, mustard seed-sized faith placed in the almighty creator of heaven and earth can do an amazing job of landscaping in your heart. You can say this mulberry tree, be uprooted and thrown into the Mediterranean, and off it goes. On another occasion, same sort of thing. He says, you can say to this mountain, be lifted up and cast into the Mediterranean, and off it goes. God can do amazing things in the heart of people who trust him, even with a little bit of faith placed in the right, the right object of faith, this immense God. We can't do it on our own. We can't live this way. That's his point. But trust God, and the kingdom comes in your heart, and you find yourself capable of living faithfully and capable of forgiving more than you ever thought you could forgive. And then another problem arises. We manage to live that way. We manage to trust God so our lives aren't depriving people of the gospel of the kingdom. We're loving and serving and bearing witness. And then our tendency kicks in to think that we have just earned something. We've done something special, and we deserve something special. We do the hard thing, like forgiving our parents or our children or our in-laws or our wife or husband or friend or an enemy for something they've done that was hurtful and offensive. We've forgiven, and we might think that we now deserve something for God for being such a fine Christian. We forget that the only way we pull any of that off is not by our own goodness, but by our seed-sized faith placed in the immensity of God, who is love and goodness and compassion beyond our imagination. We forget that it was grace in the first place. We think we've done something and we deserve something. And that's when we expect a bonus or a tip or a raise or a perk or a benefit, something added to our account. That's when we're prone to ask, why me? Why, what did I do to deserve this when things are hard? Haven't I been good? So Jesus told a story to clarify. Imagine, he said, that you're a landowner, a farmer, and that you also own a slave. That's a metaphor that spoke pretty loudly in Jesus' day. It's something offensive to us, but we need to hear it as Jesus' disciples heard it because slavery was a huge part of that culture. And the slave was not an employee of the master. The slave was a piece of property owned by the master in that culture. And... The word Lord and slave just go together. You can't have one without the other. When we confess Jesus as Lord, we are at the same time confessing ourselves as his servant, his slave. We are owned by him. It's a, you don't do Lord without servant. You don't have servants without lords. They, they're a pair. 
And so Jesus said, imagine you're in that position. You are the owner of a human being. That person is your property and you have them out working for you. So the servant works hard all day in the field. And when the servant comes in from work, you don't say to him in that culture, sit down, Let, take a load off. Let me help you out. Let me fix you some dinner. Thank you so much for all your hard work today. No, he says what the master says when the slave comes in from working the field all day, fix my dinner, take care of me, and after all that work is done, then you can do what you need to do, take of your own needs. And the master doesn't even owe him a word of thanks, Jesus said. And then he does a little twist with us. He said, I want you to imagine being a master, given our culture. How would you respond? That's how you'd respond. But he said, now twist it for a little bit and think of yourself as the servant. At the end of it all, he says in verse, at the end of that, verse 10, so you also, when you have done everything you were told to do in the kingdom of God, should say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. Jesus said, for, you forget that it's grace when you think that you've earned something. It's grace that allows you to forgive. It's grace that allows you to live faithfully. It is trust in the immensity of God that makes it even possible. And so don't think when you've done these things that somehow you've put God in your debt. All that forgiving, all that faithfulness that encouraged others to live for Christ rather than discouraging them, all that trusting in God to do more than you could do in yourself, all of that did not earn one thing with God. It was our duty. It was our obligation as servants of Christ. We didn't put God in our debt by faith, our faithfulness. God owes us nothing. I want you to be careful to listen to Jesus' words and, and not misunderstand. He, he's not really talking about how the Lord relates to us. He's talking about how we as servants of God are supposed to relate to God. In fact, on another occasion earlier in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus told a parable about a Lord and a servant that just turns the Lord's work upside down. He says in Luke 12, 35, be dressed and ready for service and keep your lamps burning like servants waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet so that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. And then listen, it will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he will dress himself to serve. He will have them recline at table and come and wait on them. He says, that's the kind of master I am. I will take care of you. I'm going to take care of you. But in this parable, he says, think about the kind of servant you are. Don't think that you're my employee and that you've earned something by your work. You're my servant. Jesus addressed our posture. We don't earn God's favor by our faithfulness. That's merely our obligation. You can find throughout the Scripture, 1 Corinthians 6, 2 Corinthians 5, 1 Peter 1. Again and again, the Scripture says we are owned by God. We belong to Him. He bought us with a price. And if in His upside-down kingdom He determines to be extravagant to us and gird Himself in service and bless us generously with grace as we serve Him, that's His privilege, but it's not His obligation. God owes us nothing. If He wishes to be the opposite of the lords and masters in His culture and show generosity to us when we return from the fields. That's his right. It's not his debt to us. If he chooses to bless us or thank us with a good, well done, good and faithful service, that's certainly his privilege, but it's not his responsibility. If he wants to graciously offer us reward for our service, that's his doing. It's not required. We are servants, unworthy servants. We have no leverage over God at all. It is ours to live faithfully, to forgive always, and to place our seed-sized faith in the immense heart of God. And when we've done our best and worked our hardest, we go, we do so because it pleases Him, not to put Him in our debt. We don't labor for reward from God or God's protection from things in this world. That would be no longer to live in grace, but we do labor. We don't live faithfully so we can be rewarded, but we do seek to live faithfully. We don't forgive to earn God's favor, but we do forgive and seek reconciliation because we have been forgiven and reconciled. We don't treat one another with tenderheartedness and kindness because it gets God's attention or gets us somewhere with God. We do it because God has treated us with tenderheartedness and compassion. The Christian life, in other words, is not a balance scale on which we pile our works up and expect God to step in and do His. God has already placed the weight of His Son 
on the cross on one side of the scale. God took the initiative. He loved us first. And for the rest of our life in this world, we can do all of the dutiful, obliged responsibilities of living faithfully, generously, kindly, seeking reconciliation and forgiveness, bearing suffering and hurt. We can do all of that, and we cannot budge that side of the scale one bit. The Christian life is not a living toward reward. It is a living out of grace. It is response, always response, never initiative, a response to God's grace. We love because he first loved us. We forgive because we've been forgiven. We open our hearts in love to one another, even our enemies, because God, when we were enemies, opened his heart to us in Christ. And when we have done our best and forgiven the hardest, when our spiritual muscles ache from coming in out of the field because living life in this kingdom is a struggle in this world, when we have done all of that, we say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. Let's pray together. Our Father, I know that in this room there are men and women and young people that are struggling with some really hard things in their life. Help them to struggle with your presence, with their faith in you. And help them to do it because you've loved them already and could not love them more. And help them to do what is right when it hurts and when it's difficult and with no expectation of reward. I pray you give them strength, all of us strength, for this journey we have. We seek to live right side up in a world that's upside down. I pray especially, God, for those in this room who need to have the capacity to forgive in their heart right now. I ask you to help them by faith in you to find the capacity to forgive and reconcile. I pray for those especially right now that are struggling to live faithfully in your world in front of others, that they'd be able to do that, moving in a direction of your kingdom. Help us, God. We seek to do these things and live these things as a part of our real everyday life. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.